Welcome back into the Trib Preps video series here for our first Friday night recap of high school football. My name is Colton Bartholomew, reporter here at the Tribune. This is Todd Sommerfeld to my left, our sports editor, and to my right, Alex Van Hooten, another sports reporter here. So uh, obviously we had a busy Friday night with our first high school football games. Wisconsin gets underway. Uh, we are at five games tonight here at the Tribune with all of our staffers. So make sure you're on lacrossetribune.com, reading all of our game stories and watching the other videos from highlights to video interviews with players and coaches afterwards. Lots of stuff to keep you entertained and uh, looking up to uh, high school football here. So um, let's jump into the scores really fast. Uh, we had about a dozen games uh, tonight. DeSoto takes care of one walk center 40 to six. Oak Claire Memorial comes back against Logan 47 to 22. Onalaska holds off Hudson 21 14. GET got the best of West Salem 14 to six. Holman took down Chippewa Falls 27 to seven. Sparta with the biggest score of the day 70 to 16 over Black River Falls. And uh, their Division I prospect, Cole Wisniewski, didn't play much of the second quarter or second half. But he scored a bunch of touchdowns. Yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, Toma takes care of Austin 20 to 14. Big win for them to start their year. Blair Taylor takes down on Alaska Luther 28 to 14. Osceola beat Arcadia 41 to 8. Brookwood beat Boscobel 47 to 8. Darlington over Westby 20 to 12. Mineral Point 46 to 2 over Viroqua. And then Cashin Ann. Why are we at Fremont? Why are we Fremont? 20 to 14. <laughs> Little shout out to the people that watch the uh, preview because I still didn't learn how to say that name. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's start with the games that we were at tonight. I was at the Onalaska Hudson game. Todd, you were over at Holman for Chippewa Falls. Um, and then, Alex, you were uh, at West Salem for the GET game. I want to start with that one actually because you pretty much called it on the nose. You were almost right on the score. You yeah, said so 9 to close. 6. Yeah, so close. <laughs> you said 9 to 6. A little too much faith in the kicking game. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, GET gets the best of West Salem there, 14 to 6. Uh, we knew it was going to be a defensive mm -hmm. game. We knew it was going to be a physical game. But what were some of the things that jumped out to you after watching that, that week one game? Yeah, um, I knew Bryce Burns was good coming in, you know, and obviously, you know, when I did the preview out there, that was a big talk of, was him, you know, kind of being the guy. But, man, he had a run tonight that was uh, probably one of the top runs of the year, Candace. Um, he had 60. One, yeah, <laughs> yeah, six one. <laughs> well, keep reading this Yeah, but, I mean, he had a 60 yard, six yard touchdown where, I mean, before that, the GT offense had just 32 yards at, towards the end of the third quarter, or second quarter there. Oh, wow. And he took a run, and there was... I mean, there, it shouldn't have been 60 yards. And he <laughs> broke three tackles either behind or around the line of scrimmage. And then probably one of the nastiest stiff arms I've seen on the side of the state in a while. I just shoved the guy to the ground and took it to the house. I think also was surprised when I was talking to Justin Yen, the West Salem coach after. Bryce Burns, they, were, they knew about the strength. They just didn't know about the speed. He also displayed great speed as well and got out on the edge a couple of times. And like that touchdown, he blew by, blew by guys. And they were not catching him. Some breakaway speed, so that was really good to see. Also, um, Luke Vance, a guy that um, you know not many people knew about coming into the season, had a big that ended up being the game winning touchdown at the end of the fourth quarter, about two and a half left, a sixty yard bomb that he just took it around the corner, and I mean he was gone. It, it, it was like he was there. It was like he was there, and he wasn't. I mean, <laughs> Bryce Burns. It was funny when I came up to talk to him after. Burns called uh, Vance the fastest guy, in not one county but two counties around Galesville. <laughs> so he's got speed to burn out there, and uh, I think that was the biggest thing I saw was you know. Bryce Burns being really good, and also him getting some help, too, from guys not named, you know, Brandon Booz or Soy Schmidt, but, you know, Luke Vance came up for him. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things we're going to do with these recap videos is the biggest highlight and the biggest thing you learn. So you just heard Alex's big highlight from the GET West Salem game. Obviously, that 60, what was it, 65-yard run, you said? 66. 66-yard run for Bryce Burns. That was the highlight of that one. What, what was the biggest takeaway for you? Um, what, what was what you say the biggest thing you learned from that game, either on either side of the ball, really? I would say um, GT's defense is a little bit better than I think people originally thought too. Um, you know, they have a, the thing is they have a lot of guys playing both ways. You know, Sawyer Schmidt's playing both ways, Bryce is playing both ways. Same with Brandon Booz is playing both ways. So that's gonna be something to keep an eye on if they those guys get worn down as the season goes on. But those two, I mean, they were flying around the ball and they were tackling well too. That was you know we're we're at this time of year. You know, tackling is the big thing that you know teams kind of struggle with. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say GT tackled really well, and that was West Salem did not, and that was the difference of the game. Absolutely. All right, so we'll jump over to the uh, Holman game, and we talked about it a little bit before or yesterday, Todd, that this is one of those things that they the Holman tries to do is challenge themselves every. Uh, 
or non-conference games with some big schools. Yes. Chippewa Falls obviously falls into that court category. And Holman took it to him from the first play, literally the first play on the kickoff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a big hit on the first play and really kind of set the tone for things. And then Holman came out and, and got a stop and then or two stops and scored in their first two drives and, and really kind of separated itself right away. I uh, was impressive by impressed by the way they ran the ball. Uh, in terms of highlight, I mean, Jaden Abraham really played a good game, and, and he's a kid you can read about in, on our website, lacrossetribune.com, on Saturday and, and in Sunday's Tribune. Uh, he, he's a guy that they were counting on last year out of the backfield, and then he broke his wrist at the scrimmage mm. and didn't get back on the field until the playoffs. And by then, you know, you're behind everybody else, and he's not on special teams, so it wasn't really part of anything. Uh, he, he got a chance to carry the ball a lot uh, tonight, 114 yards and a touchdown. Uh, played a really good game, kind of eye-opening. Um, in, in terms of a takeaway, we knew going into the season that uh, Holman had three quarterbacks. They sure. decided to go with Cameron Weber, who played a good game tonight uh, and, and put the other guys in some different spots. And, and still, Ryland Wall looked really good at linebacker, for, mm. for one. Uh, and he was their quarterback for most of last season. Um, but So we knew they had three quarterbacks. Now we know they have two kickers. <laughs> uh, they, they had uh, uh, Brecken Turner kick a 41-yard field goal and then Spencer Malone kick a 26-yard field goal. And that's something I've never seen. Uh, it's not often that you have a team with two different players that can kick a field goal in a season. They had it, it happen in week one. Uh, right. They sent two guys out there, and they, and they both uh, uh, made good on their attempts. But, uh, so, that, so that was a little bit of a surprise for this one. But in, in terms of my takeaway is I, I think the Holman defense is really good. They same GETs uh, was Holman for the most part, uh, same tackled very well, hit really hard, and that's mm-hmm. kind of been a trademark in Holman for defense for a while. Uh, but tonight it kind of seemed like it was even for week one it was turned up a notch on that, and and I thought they played very well defensively. We've had some good kickers in this area. Just get back to your kicker point. We've had some good kickers in this area the last few years, but kid making a 41 yarder on the first night that's pretty impressive. Yeah. They haven't had it as much close. time. As... It wasn't close. That would have been good for. 50, I bet. And how many schools are just begging for one kicker? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just trying to make extra points. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of teams that are just stuck with going for two. I mean, Central, yeah. Look at Central. You know. Yeah. And, but, so they got two guys that can kick. And, the, and when I was at practice uh, last week, the week before, uh, they had a couple guys out there kicking these two guys. Um, and while I was watching, they weren't kicking real deep. But as I was watching, I probably watched eight, nine, ten kicks, something like that, and one was missed. <laughs> so, I mean, that's obviously nobody on the field or anything, so they don't put a lot of stock in it. But they were kicking well that day of practice, and they kicked well tonight. Absolutely. So, looking at uh, Onalaska versus Hudson uh, over at Onalaska tonight, that we thought it was going to be like a playoff game, and it really was just from the, the first uh, the first play. You could tell these teams were evenly matched. Both teams had the physicality. Uh, a little bit probably the advantage on that side uh, goes to Hudson. Their line was huge. Uh, they run this option offense with a lot of motion, a lot of counters, a lot of different things that are trying to deceive you. And they got, I don't ask, confused a couple of times, a couple of big plays that end up becoming touchdowns. Um, but for the most part, I was super impressed by the way that Alaska's front seven contained the run game and didn't let uh, the, the backs and the, the sweeping, I guess you would call them receivers, they, they ended up becoming running backs, but they start a wide receiver. Uh, the kind of sweeping guys uh, get to the edge. That They never really turned the corner on those. Their big plays all came from counters and guys getting through on inside runs. So uh, Onalaska really doing good, a good job on the outside, um, I'd say was probably the biggest thing that they did to succeed today. Uh, the number one highlight, though, for me was watching um, David Block, uh, H-back, tight end kind of, everything guy type of type of guy for the Alaska offense. He catches a, a screen pass after Hudson had been kind of blitzing and getting into the backfield with some pressure. So they throw a screen at him, Alaska does, and it was basically luck, th- three or four offensive linemen and two Hudson guys oh, for about 50 yards. <laughs> and uh, he, he knocked one down with a stiff arm, and then it was just kind of running past the other guys. But uh, a huge play for him, and it was the only catch of the game, a 47-yard touchdown. A guy that didn't get the ball very much, he, he watched uh, Jack Weber, another tight end from Onalaska all last season, he said, kind of learned the ropes from that, and now he's ready to make his mark, and uh, obviously did it week one. So I'd say that's the highlight for me. The biggest takeaway is this Onalaska secondary is the real deal. They broke up, I had the count, of, they broke up five passes with hits either right before the ball got there or right as the ball was getting there, um, and one of them was 
probably going to be a touchdown if it was a Hank Olsen doesn't make the play uh, in, late in the game. That was actually probably going to be the tying touchdown had he not made that play. And then Nick Pika had an interception. That was kind of a jump ball. The quarterback threw it up a little bit, but uh, he still made the play. And then Jess Ondell to seal the game at the end from uh, – Hudson's last kind of gasp on the fourth and ten. He makes that interception, finishes the game off. Uh, the physicality, the speed that they have, and the ability to play the ball in the air. Sometimes you have a defensive back that can run and stay with the receiver, but just doesn't have those hands or the coordination to make the catches. These guys do. So when you're going to throw in on Alaska, take out the fact that they're going to have a good pass rush. This secondary is going to be tough to throw on. I, I think what we saw in week one, is that the MVC is going to be fun? Yeah, it's this is going to be a great yeah, season. This is be awesome. And I, and I did, did well against the Big Rivers Conference mm-hmm. uh, tonight. It, even Logan, yeah, I wasn't getting Logan to them, doing yeah. well against Memorial early. They had him down twenty-two to seven at least, and it's fourteen nothing, mm. twenty-two to seven. Uh, and then Memorial, of course, came back. But I, I don't know that a lot of people thought Logan would be able to hang in that game, especially mm. for as long as it did. So you know, you factor that in, and I, I think this on Alaska win over Hudson that is really big. Yeah. yeah. That's a huge uh, I, one. I think Holman was was uh, a little ahead of Chippewa going into week one, so I, it, that one wasn't that surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, they did play very well in beating Chippewa, though. But I, I, that's that's one thing that really stands out to me in, in, in Central's domination of North, even though Claire North isn't that big. But MVC certainly fared well in, in week one for this. Uh, give us something to, to really look forward to in the coming weeks and when we get into those conference games. One thing that jumped out to me, because we kind of heard it from all over the place, but a lot of teams having a lot of players playing both ways is what, Alex, what you mentioned, kind of that, that grind-down factor. How can these coaches and these players either establish some depth, get some, some different guys rotated in on one side of the ball to keep these guys fresh? Because we heard it from Logan. Uh, like you mentioned, Todd, they were up 14 nothing. They ended up falling behind. Obviously, Memorial's a good team. We knew right. it was going to be kind of a tough game for Logan to begin with, but right. uh, we, they said second half they wilted a little bit just because so many guys were playing both ways. On Alaska had a bunch of issues with cramps and guys mm-hmm. missing a few plays here and there as they were trying to catch their wind. And then uh, just all over the conference, we heard about two-way players. That's going to be the bread and butter of a lot of these teams. How do they establish some depth throughout the season? So I think that's something that we got to keep an eye on is, especially if, you know, if you look at on Alaska tonight, if Nathan Lubinsky, who I thought got hurt, ended up being another guy, he was actually okay. So no, no worries there. But if Nathan Lubinsky goes down, that's going to throw off both sides of on Alaska's team in a huge way. So just finding these coaches and teams, finding ways to give them little breaks where they can while still maximizing their efforts is going to be an interesting thing throughout the season. And, and the teams that have those issues, are it's going to be tougher for them to stay at the top of the conference, too. I, I mean, I'm still, I, I still think uh, on Alaska, Ullman are the, the top two teams in the MVC, and I don't think anything we saw tonight changes my mind on that. Um, we'll, we'll see what Central can do. Sparta surprised me by scoring 70, of course. I, I thought it would be a one-sided game. You don't figure anybody's going to go out and score 70. So, no one does, but, yeah. But School we'll, record for we'll Sparta, too. Yes, we'll, but what that tells us is there is a lot there around Colas Nesky. And it may be a bunch of names of kids we don't know, but we're certainly going to find out yeah, more about them. Yeah, make their names for themselves, yeah. All right, well, that's going to do it for our Week 1 Recap. Make sure you're staying on lacrossetribune.com for all of our stories. We were just counting up, and before we started recording here, we're going to have seven stories up that were just written and printed today on Friday, and then there's going to be four more, four or five more on Saturday, depending on how things uh, shake out timing-wise. So a ton of stuff from Week 1. And we're going to videos, 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 yeah, uh, this recap podcast or video podcast, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, <laughs> uh, all that stuff on lacrosstribute.com. Make sure you're staying up on that. Uh, we will be back next week with our preview on Thursday and then our recap on Friday. But for Colton Bartholomew, Todd Sommerfeld, now it's Van Hooden. Thanks for watching.